Okay, let's get started. We're talking about stem plots and histograms now. These are extremely useful ways of visualizing some data when it's numeric. You don't want to use these with anything that's not numerical data. Don't use these with categorical data. Sometimes people fudge and use this with ordinal data, but that's actually a no-no because these really imply some numerical qualities, so you should only use them with numerical data. Um, so here are the learning objectives, which is basically understand how to use and read stem and leaf plots and histograms. So let's get on that. Oh yeah, there's this basic principle that we should remember. The way you treat the data depends on what the data is, basically, or data are. There's that distinction in the world. So here's a stem plot, and here's another stem plot written in whiteboard, apparently, and, or Microsoft Paint. And here's a stem plot with all sorts of fancy doodads on it, some parentheses and some asterisks and a, a key legend, something and everything. This stem plot has tons of information. A stem plot is a way of organizing information um, so you can look at the distribution. Uh, and, it, and the way you read a stem plot is you look at the number of digits. You, you tend to want to use, or you definitely want to use a fixed width font so that these numbers line up with each other so that the width of this bar tells you how many observations fall in this little category. So it's just like a, a grouped frequency distribution. So every one of these digits represents one observation. The way you do a stem plot, you usually have a single digit representing one observation, and then the combination of the digits over here on the stem and the digits in the leaf tells you what the value was, although you usually need some sort of key, like 1 bar 2 equals 0 0.12. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about what's going on with stem plots. It's a lot like, actually a huge amount like a grouped frequency table. You can actually make a stem plot from a grouped frequency table. Um, you, to make a stem plot, you need to divide all the values at a certain power of 10. You could divide them at the decimal point. You could divide them one or two or three points to the right or to the left. And where you divide them depends on what your data are. With visualizations, you're always trying to just make sense out of what's happening. You're trying to represent things in a way that humans find easy to understand. And so sometimes you try one thing, you try another thing. With a stem plot, you might try a couple of different uh, divisions before you figure out the one that works for you. And then you arrange them in a kind of interesting table. Each single digit to the right of the stem, so each number gets split. And each single digit, rounded off digit to the right of that stem, represents one value in the data set. So every number gets turned into essentially two digits. A digit to the left of the stem, which is a certain power of 10, and a rounded off digit to the right of the stem, which is one power of 10 smaller. Anyway, I'll show you. So here's an example. Here are some Fahrenheit temperatures that I made up fake that might have been recorded on 25 consecutive days in the month of May around here or somewhere. So here they are, 39.3 degrees, you got 61 degrees, 61.9, 70.5, etc. Let's make a stem plot out of those. First we would put them in order, uh, as with many other visualizations, and then we have to decide how to split the stem from the leaves. So in this case, uh, I think it makes some sense to divide between the tens and ones position. So here's an example. There, one of the observations is 21.6, the very first one, 21.6. That would round to 22, because we're going to split between the 20 and the 1. So 1 1.6 is closer to 2, so that would turn into 2 uh, as the stem and a 2 in the leaf, because so, it's 22. And 51.7 would be 50 and 2. 79.2 would be 7 and 9. So let's look at how all these work. Here's the stem plot. And you can see down here on the left-hand side, you have all the powers of 10. You want to be continuous and not skip any. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I didn't start with 1 or 0 because there aren't any of those in my data. I suppose I could have if I wanted to show some blank spaces. And some people want to show a blank space at the bottom or the top of all graphs and things. But I don't, I'm not worried about that. We have an 8. Even though there wasn't any 80 anything, of course we keep the 8 to keep the sequence going. And we have a 9 something. So let's see how all these things work out. So this number right here, 21.6, that's 20 and 2. 21.6 is 20, two tens over here. And then to the right of that, we split everything right here between the tens and the ones. To the right of that is a 2, so 22. So this 2 means 22. This 9 means 29 because 28.7 rounds to 29 if you're rounding it 
to the ones, which is basically what we're doing here. And this 9 means 29.3. So these two things are the same category. We want a single digit for each um, observation in our data set. So skipping down here, 59.8 actually rounds to 60, right? And so you have a 6 and a 0. So that 0, because it's in the 6 row, tells you that that number is more or less 60. Or at least it rounds off to 60. It's in the 60 category. This one's 62. This one's 64. 64 again. You keep repeating if it's the same one because you want to repeat so you see how many things are in each category. 68 and 68. So is this making sense? This is how you make a stem plot. Now the way you read a stem plot, you look at this pattern. This pattern kind of goes up and then drops. There's more and more and more and more observations and then very few observations. It kind of drops right off. So you have some numbers going from the even the low to the high 20s, and then the 30s and the 40s, so this is temperatures, and the 50s and the 60s, but then suddenly we have almost no temperatures in the 70s. We had two 70s temperatures, and then nothing higher than except that, except this one crazy time when it was 91. So um, this shows you the pattern in your data. That's what stem plots are for. They show us the shape of the distribution. The shape of a distribution shows us patterns. Is it skewed to one side? Very similar to what a box plot shows us. As a matter of fact, we use these really for similar reasons. Is it symmetrical? Is it Does it have kind of like a lump in the middle and then it tapers off to both sides, low and high? Is it flat? Are all the values more or less evenly distributed? Is it bimodal? That means are there two lumps in it, which is kind of an interesting pattern. Um, every number value is represented in it. And there's lots of different ways to make it fancy. You can do all sorts of cute things. Um, there's a million different possibilities for all graphs, and there are people inventing new ones every day. So another way to represent one variable is really similar to a stem plot, except in use, instead of using digits, we just use a dot. So in a sense, we've actually lost some information. So if we make a dot plot, and then we stack the dots vertically or horizontally, you can do it either way, usually vertically, um, the, when two dots fall in the same category of values, then in the same bin, then we stack them on each other. It's just like a, a grouped frequency distribution, just like a stem plot. And we can see the shape in the center and where the lump is and where there's, a, where there's skew, whether things are spread out or clustered together. We can see all of those things. It's very similar to a stem plot, of course. So here's a stacked, um, a stacked dot plot. So this is difference in promotion rates. I don't actually remember what this is, but you can see every one of these dots is one observation in the data set. This is the highest observation, this is the lowest observation, and you can see the most frequent observation is whatever it is. This is 0 0.05 maybe, because that's probably 0 0.1. It's kind of an odd arrangement of, of data. But anyway, that's the, uh, that's the idea behind this. And if we take that one step further, if we stack those dots, so we sh smoosh all these dots together, then we have a histogram. So it's a stacked dot plot, but the dots are all square. It's very much like just stacking some blocks and you stack them tightly, which makes some bars. So if you get rid of those horizontal lines in the middle of the vertical bars in a dot plot, then you just have a bar for each value, for each category. And then you smoosh all the bars together. The reason we do that is just a convention so that um, nobody thinks you're looking at a bar chart. So you can look at a chart, and as long as a person has followed the quote-unquote rules of graphics, which get broken for good reasons all the time, but not in this class. So if you look at some bars and they're separated, most of the time that should mean that that's a categorical variable and therefore that's a bar chart. But if you look at the bars and they're snugged right up against each other, most of the time that should mean that that is a histogram and it's a numerical variable that you're looking at. Uh, like I said, people break the rules and I believe I even have some charts that break the rules in some of these PowerPoints because people play fast and loose with these things. So histograms, hist, histo or something, that comes from a Greek word meaning density. And so these are charts of density, of the mathematical concept of density. So vertical in these charts is density. So it's charts of density. That's a mathematical thing for functions, which, you know, isn't really my background, but I do kind of get it. So here's ma Major League Baseball salaries. It's salary in millions of dollars. This is not a symmetrical distribution. Income and pay always looks like this. You always have a whole bunch of people not making very much money, and... As you go up the scale for the amount of money people make, 
the number of people making that money gets lower and lower and lower and lower. This is a very familiar shape of a histogram, this kind of ski slope going to the right. This is what we call a positively skewed distribution. Here's uh, a whole hundreds, it looks like, hundreds of individuals travel time to work. Now what you have to imagine is that every one of these is a is a block. Now these blocks are probably flat rectangles, just so you could fit this all on the page. And you can mess a little bit with the dimensions of your chart to try and make it fit on the page. If you mess too much with it, then maybe you're lying and trying to deceive people with statistics. But you can see that this is making a fairly beautiful normal distribution. A little bit positively skewed because the, the data are lumped a little to the left here. So this is this is a pretty bellish curve there. So this is the average amount of um, time that people take to travel to work. Probably hundreds of people in some sort of survey. So this is percentage of Hispanic residents in the counties. I think we've seen the county data before and these are uh, those same counties. There are uh, several dozen counties. Uh, so this is 2,000 Hispanic residents, 1,500 um, oh sorry, this is 2,000 counties, this is 1,500 counties. So yeah, this is always frequency, so there are thousands of counties. So there are a few counties that have lots and lots, or, or that have almost no Hispanic residents. Sorry, let me start over. There are lots of counties, around 2,000, that have almost no Hispanic residents, and then there are very few counties that are nearly 100% Hispanic. So where I was teaching is definitely down here. Our county, Hidalgo County, Texas, was 95%, so we were here. So again, this ski slope thing, and that's a long tail distribution where you have uh, a lot of the data piled up around zero or a very low, low value, and then the frequency gets smaller and smaller and smaller and tapers off towards very high values. And there's very few people getting those high values, or very few cases, in this case, counties. Infant mortality in nations, another long tail distribution, but not quite as much like a crazy ski slope. So this is infant mortality rate per 1,000 births, and this is the proportion of nations. So this has been standardized, so up here would be 37.5% 30, of the nations included in this study. So you have that ski slope effect again. So once we've got these numerical charts, it becomes useful to, to, com to compare multiple groups on a single numerical variable. And that's pretty common. You do a study and you have the men versus the women, you have the Republicans versus the Democrats, you have the, uh, I don't know, the Green Bay Packers fans versus the Steelers fans versus the Bears fans, etc. So people kind of naturally fall into certain groups that we are interested in studying and we want to compare those groups in various ways. Well, these numerical charts, essentially all of them, can be manipulated so that you can show multiple groups in one chart. You can compare the center values, like averages, like the mean and median. You can compare variability, like the spread of the data. Uh, are some, do some groups have a whole wide range of data and other groups, all the individuals have really similar values. And this is pretty easy. You just take any numerical plot and then you find an interesting and useful, okay, not interesting, plots, you shouldn't go for interesting. You find a very useful, easy to read way to put all of those uh, multiple numerical plots in one graph. You can do them side by side, one on top of the other one. You can overlap them using some partial transparency, etc. And they should share one axis. Now sometimes you rotate things 90 degrees, but one axis should be shared so that you can compare these things head to head. So here's an example. This is one of my studies, political affiliation from liberal to conservative. So negative two is very liberal, liberal, um, centrist, middle of the road, conservative, and very conservative. And these are box plots. I made them colors because apparently I'm obsessed with coloring my graphs. In this particular type of box plot, don't get hung up on the fact that the whiskers are dashed. Sometimes that happens. It's just an aesthetic decision. Um, here are some outliers. So you can see that these middle values rise and then they draw and then it drops again and uh, this particular type of block box plot there's a strange decision that I find useful that the width of the box plot is more or less proportional to the number of individuals in the group to the proportion of individuals in the group so there weren't very many people who said they were very conservative and uh, the mean on the victim blame score was actually lower. So you have this positive thing where as people become more conservative they blame victims more and more for crime because that's what this y-axis is here. But then when you, the extreme conservative individuals, they go back to blaming people about as much as the neutral people do. 
So that's an interesting little finding there. Uh, here are two overlapping charts. So you have, um, I actually don't remember which two groups these are, but one group is in the salmon pink color and the other is in the blue color. And then the purple was used to show where they overlap each other. So you can see that the blue group, the average is shifted a little to the left. Uh, so accountability ratings for offenders for the, this, that's, that's from this study was a little bit lower for the blue group. And then for the pink group, that has a lump a little more to the right. So accountability ratings for offenders will shift a little more to the right. And we're all done with that right now. We're going to dive into some more ways to look at numerical data next time.